In section 5.1, we're going to look at approximating and computing area. We're actually quite proficient at computing the area of particular shapes. For instance, we could look at a rectangle. This rectangle will not be starting at the origin. This rectangle will go from 5 to 10 on the x-axis and then have a height of 4 here. So in this particular case, the area of this rectangle is pretty easy to figure. The area of a rectangle is base times height. The height in this particular case is given as 4. The base is not going to be easy to determine with just a glance. We do need to do a subtraction here is 10 minus 5. So we can't just go after 10 because not the entire uh, rectangle goes toward the origin. So in this case, 10 minus 5 is 5. 5 times 4 is 20. And in this particular case, we have units squared. So inches squared, feet squared, miles squared. Now there's a couple things to note here. This graph is continuous and positive, and this will be important when we're trying to find uh, the areas of shapes other than a nice little rectangular, rectangular region. So again, this graph is continuous and positive. So we can find the area of a rectangle, the area of a square, the area of a circle, the area of a trapezoid. Those are all pretty basic formulas that we all know. But there's also the shapes that we do not have a particular formula for that's not easy to find. In the case where it's not a shape that we know a formula for, we can imagine a curve and the area underneath a curve, for instance. So here's our curve. We might be interested in finding the area between some point A and some point B. So the area that we're trying to find is this shaded region right here. Well, that's not an area that I know a formula for right off the bat. So how would we determine the area underneath of this? First of all, when we're talking about the area under the curve, the, or under the graph, that means the area between the graph and the x-axis. So if this graph went below the x-axis, we'd have to talk about what the meaning was in terms of area. We have to be pretty careful here. The definition of under the graph, meaning the area between the graph and the x-axis again, assumes that the graph is continuous and positive. Now what we mean by continuous, we can see that when we move from A to B, there's no gaps in the graph, there's no vertical asymptotes, there's no hollow points. And what we mean by positive is this entire region from A to B is above the x-axis, so all of its y values are positive. Well, one thing that we could do is we could estimate the area of this graph using a rectangle. So because we're only interested in the interval from A to B, I could draw a rectangle, let's say, like this and look for the area of this rectangle and say this is a pretty good estimate of the area underneath that curve. Now if you look at this, this entire rectangle that I've drawn is inscribed inside of that curve. It's an underestimate. Meaning if I find the area of this red rectangle, it will actually be less than the area underneath this curve. It will be less than that area because these regions up here in blue would need to be included as well. So the region is in red is an underestimate. I could actually look at an overestimate over here as well. This particular triangle in red on the right hand graph is not inscribed, but it's circumscribed. Now this particular graph would not be an underestimate, it would be an overestimate. So if I use this one rectangle to approximate that area, underneath the curve, you can see that I have more shaded red than I do above, than I do under the entire curve. So this would be an overestimate. So the true area is probably somewhere in between the two areas that I have shaded in here. So on the left hand side here, when I have my inscribed rectangle, I can tell that my area of this rectangle will actually be an underestimate of the true area underneath the curve. And here, the, ins the circumscribed rectangle will be an overestimate. So the true area is somewhere between the underestimated area and the overestimated area. And our job is trying to figure out what is the best estimate and how can we come up with that best estimate or even an exact answer. One way we can look at this is we can say, in this case, I only used one rectangle to under and one re rectangle to overestimate. So what if I had used two rectangles? And so out of this, just this one rectangle right here, what if I would have split it in half and maybe said something like, um, I'm going to use this and this is my two rectangles.
maybe I could get a better estimate that way because this area that's an under and this area that's an overestimate might come closer to approximating the true area once they cancel each other out. So one thing that we're going to do here is we're going to increase the number of rectangles that we used for this approximation. But one thing that we always need to think about are these rectangles are going to be assumed to be of equal width for now. But if we decide to split this up into two rectangles, I also have to remember that I can have inscribed and circumscribed rectangles as well. For this particular case, then, I need to choose because you can see here that some will be inscribed and some will be circumscribed depending on whether my function is increasing or decreasing. And some functions, of course, will do both like the example we have here. Because we want intervals of equal length, A and B is bisected, so I find this particular midpoint. And then I have to choose what types of endpoints that I want. When we're talking about endpoints, we're talking about trying to figure out a rule for producing these rectangles. Now in this particular case, I'm going to be using left endpoints. That means I start at the far left point, in this case would be A. I go straight up till I hit the graph, and then I go across until I hit where this midpoint would be, and I bring down my length particularly here. And then at this midpoint that I'll call M, I go straight up, hit the graph, and then move across to my next point. Now in this particular case, my next point is the far end point, so I'm done. So I have two rectangles of equal width, and the height is based on the left end point of each rectangle. Now over here, I'm using right end points. So I start on my value of A here, my further end point to the left, and I move until I hit my midpoint. Now this would be the right hand side of this first rectangle. I move straight up until I hit the graph. And then instead of moving to the right like I did for right endpoints, I hit the graph and move toward the left because this tells me the height of this particular rectangle. Now then I go to the other end of my second rectangle, go straight toward the top, hit the graph, and then go to the height straight across from where my midpoint will be at this particular given height if I plug B into my function. So this is left endpoint, start on the left. This is right endpoint, start on the right. Now, how many rectangles would provide the best estimate? One rectangle, one inscribed and one circumscribed, did a pretty good job. I think two rectangles looks even better because I have some area that's a little too much and some area that's a little too little, and they end up kind of canceling each other out. Same thing over here. So one rectangle inscribed, one rectangle circumscribed seem to be an okay estimate. Two seem to be an even better deal. Well, really, an infinite number of rectangles would be best, but since I can't actually plug in an infinite number of rectangles, I'm going to start using the concept of a limit and take the number of rectangles as n approaches infinity. Now, remember, these rectangles are assumed to be of equal width. We have different processes depending on whether we're using a right endpoint approximation, a left endpoint approximation, or pretty soon we'll start talking about a midpoint approximation as well. The first one that we're going to look at is a right endpoint approximation. So the first thing that we do is we divide the interval AB, and again from our picture up here, that would be the interval AB. Instead of into two rectangles, we're going to divide it into n subintervals or n rectangles of equal width. And this is kind of difficult to do because we don't know what n is yet, so I kind of have to do this in the imaginary sense. The width of each rectangle then would be delta x, and delta means change in x, so it would be b minus a, the total width, divided by n, the number of rectangles. So if I had two rectangles, I would take b minus a divided by n, and that would give me the width of each rectangle if I had two rectangles. But since I have n rectangles, I'll divide by n. This tells me that each rectangle has a base or width of delta x or change in x. Pictorially, this is a little bit easier to represent. So the things are to remember here that I have some interval from A and then our value of B is off over here somewhere and I'm not going to actually put it on here because I'm trying to split this up into n subintervals or some n rectangles and so this pattern continues on until you hit some value of B on this axis. So there's a gap between here. So we're using right endpoints. That means I start on my interval A and I go to my first rectangle, 
go vertically straight up and that tells me the height of this rectangle. So I move straight across and there's my height of my first rectangle. Well, working with the base times the height, that's the formula for the area of a rectangle. Well, the base of each one of these rectangles will be a base of delta x or a width of delta x. Now the height will change. If you look at this particular rectangle that we have here, we're plugging in a plus delta x. If we plug a plus delta x into my function, that will give me the height. So the height of this first rectangle is f of a plus delta x. The base is just delta x. Now as we move to the next rectangle, I move to the right hand side again, move vertically straight up, hit the graph, that's the height of my second rectangle. And again, the base is delta x. However, the height is no longer the same as the height of our first rectangle. So if I start with a, and I move delta x, and then one more delta x, that will give me basically the a plus two delta x, which is the x value that I'll plug in to find my corresponding y value. So this is the height of that rectangle. And this process continues on until you get to b. But we already know we actually don't get to b because we have n number of rectangles and n will approach infinity and you can't write out an infinite number of rectangles. So now we're starting to circumscribe or be on the outside because my function is increasing and I continue the same process over and over and over again. Now in this particular case I have seven rectangles. So n would equal seven in this case. But of course the best case scenario is when we have an infinite number of rectangles. So let's go ahead and write a generic formula to represent the area underneath this curve. First of all, let's look at this in the generic sense. Area is going to be base times height of triangle, or sorry, rectangle one, plus base times height of rectangle two, plus base times height of rectangle three, etc. Now in this particular case, I have seven rectangles. But first of all, I'm gonna kinda of look at this in the general sense, and then I'll look at this specifically in terms of n rectangles as well. So area, using the right endpoint, so that's why we use r sub n to represent the fact that we have a formula representing the right endpoint formula. The base of my first rectangle is delta x. The height of my first rectangle is f of a plus delta x. That means if I plug in a plus delta x, I'll get a y value out, which is the height of the function. So base times height of my first, base times height of my second, etc., all the way up to base times height of my uh, seventh rectangle. Now replacing this with seven, because we have seven rectangles, I can see here that I have a delta x in each of these that can be factored out front. If I factor the delta x out front, then I'm just left with the y values, summing the, these particular y values from the first rectangle all the way up to the seventh rectangle. So this is assuming I have a base of equal width, and that equal width is delta x. So the generic formula that I'm looking at here then is the area using the right endpoint approximation is equal to the change in x. And remember, the change in x, delta x, was b minus a over n n is the number of rectangles. So if we're looking at b minus a over n, seven rectangles, I'd have b minus a over seven. j is our indice. This means I'm going to sum this value up here. I'm going to sum these heights from the first rectangle to the nth rectangle. And I guess for consistency's sake, I should have a cap in here because the cap in here will match the cap in over here as well. This f of notation means I'm going to plug in a plus j delta x into my original function. j will change based on our summation notation. When j equals one, I'll get a plus one delta x and that will give us this value. Then I jump to two, so I have f of a plus two delta x. And that's what the summation notation means. And I'll go clear all the way up to cap n. Well in this case, I don't need to go to cap n because I have seven, so I'd replace this with a seven. So this is a formula that will be provided to you on a test or a quiz if you need it. But really it kind of makes sense. And you'll work with it often enough that you'll get very familiar with it. Let's go ahead and look at an example. So we're going to calculate r4 for the function f of x equals x squared on the interval from one to three. So one thing that might be helpful here is to get a quick idea or a curve sketch. So y equal x squared it's a parabola at the origin, and we can say here's from one to three. So this is just kind of a smaller picture. I'm gonna make a larger one here toward the end, but I want four rectangles here. 
So there's my four rectangles, two, three, four. And this says R4, so that means I'm going to use my right endpoints. So here would be right endpoints. Now if you notice, all of these rectangles that I'm drawing in are circumscribed, meaning they're all over estimates. So I'm thinking when we get done here, our actual answer that we come up with for the area will be a little bit too large. Let's go ahead and use our formula that we used, or that we developed in the last problem. It was R sub n equals delta x summation j equal 1 to cap n f of a plus j delta x. Now if you look in other textbooks, you might use an i here for the indice instead of a j, but the process is similar. The first thing to probably do is to come up with this delta x value. So delta x will be the width of each of our rectangles. Delta x will be b minus a over n. b minus a in this particular case is given by this interval up here from 1 to 3, so that would be 3 minus 1 over n. n is given by the number of rectangles that we're going to use, so that's 4. 3 minus 1 is 2, over 4 is 1 half. So my formula starts out with a 1 half. And I have r sub 4 here instead of r sub n, so I'm just using this formula. In place of delta x, we'll put 1 half, and then I'll start my summation, j equal 1 to 4, because n is equal to 4 in this case. Then we have f of a plus j delta x. Now the reason we have an a here is, is we're starting at 1. We're not starting at 0. So I always, I always have to remember that left endpoint. And sometimes that left endpoint will be a 0. So this would be 1 plus j, which will be my indice, delta x. But we already figured delta x to be 1 half. Okay, and so there is the formula I'm going to use. This means that this i plus j over 2, or 1 half j, depending on how you want to see it, is what we'll be plugging into our original function. So let's go ahead and start writing this out. So I get r sub 4 is equal to 1 half. Now this first indice will say f of 1 plus j is 1, 1 times 1 half is 1 half. So this is the case where j equal 1. Let's go ahead and plug in j equal 2 now. If we plug in j equal 2, the 1 doesn't change, and I end up with 2 times 1 half, which is 1. Then I'll plug in j equal 3. So I'll have 1 plus 3 times a half is 3 halves. And then lastly, we go all the way up to 4. So we plug in j equal 4, and I end up with 1 plus 4 times a half, which is 2. So we have a lot of values to keep track of in parentheses. 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves, so I'm just combining like terms in each one of these. 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 3 halves is the same as 2 halves plus 3 halves, which is 5 halves. 1 plus 2 is 3. Well, we know what my function is. f of x was equal to x squared. So that's my next step, is I'll plug these values into x squared. So r sub 4 is equal to 1 half times the quantity, and remember this 1 half distributes all the way through, so I need these brackets. 3 halves quantity squared, 2 squared, 5 halves quantity squared, 3 squared. And we keep simplifying, and I end up with 9 fourths plus 4 plus 25 fourths plus 9. And we're going to simplify this. Uh, 9 plus 4 is 13. 9 fourths plus 25 fourths would be uh, 34 fourths, which of course will reduce before we actually add these together. So I get 13 plus 17 halves. Finding a common denominator of 2, that would be uh, 26 plus 17 over 2. which equals 1 half times 43 over 2. And this is a 17, that almost looks like a 77. 17. So this is 43 over 2, or 43 over 4. So this is my answer. This is my approximate area under the graph of f of x equals x squared on the interval from 1 to 3. Now, do we think that this is an over or an underestimate? Well, the best way to figure out if it's an over or an underestimate is to kind of go back and look at our picture a little bit. 
Well, the picture we had before is pretty small, so I'll kind of blow that up a little bit. Now remember, this graph actually goes to first and second quadrant. I'm just going to blow this up to look at just the first quadrant. And I'm going to go from 1 to 3 here. Well, we wanted to split this up into four equal width rectangles. Okay, so halfway between 1 and 3 would be 2. Halfway between 1 and 2 would be 3 halves. So 2 halves, 3 halves, 4 halves. Here would be 5 halves and 6 halves. And I'm using my right endpoint approximation, so I'll take the right endpoint of each of these rectangles to find the height. So I can see here that when I find the area of each of these rectangles, this is an overestimate. So my true area is actually smaller than 43 fourths. So this is an overestimate. A couple of other things I'd like to note here. When we plug in our right endpoint, down here I got three halves. Up here I have three halves. And pictorially we got a two, a five halves, and then a three. So these match exactly with the formula. So sometimes drawing a picture can help you come up with these formula values if you can't figure them out from the general formula. But you kind of have to get away from that sometimes too because eventually we're going to want an infinite number of rectangles. And of course, with an infinite number of rectangles, it's kind of hard to draw those out and actually find the area of each one. The next thing we want to do is we want to look at the process for a left endpoint approximation. We'll start the process identically with the right endpoint approximation. So we'll have a curve. We'll split it up into n number of rectangles. The width of each rectangle is the same. It's a value of delta x. Delta x will equal b minus a over n. So I have a fixed width. And then what I'll do is instead of coming over here to start at the right endpoint like I did last time, I'll start at the left endpoint and I'll plug in the left endpoint to find the height of that particular rectangle. So I'll plug in the left endpoint here at A, move toward the top, and that tells me the height of this rectangle. Go to the next endpoint, left endpoint, top. Now this was inscribed, this one was kind of a little inscribed and circumscribed. This one is definitely circumscribed. Plug in, you can see from here, and again we're looking at the left endpoint approximations. Plugging in from the left, etc. So again, this is our kind of our generic formula, and this process would continue until we got to our value of B on the right endpoint. What we have drawn out here is a general equation, let's say if we use seven rectangles. So the left endpoint approximation, L sub n, would equal delta x, okay, f of a, plus f of a plus delta x, plus f of a plus 2 delta x, and this process will continue. Now this one changes a little bit. This one does not go up to a plus 7 delta x, because on this last rectangle, if I use the left-hand endpoint, it only goes up to 6 delta x. So it goes up to one less than the number of rectangles. So instead of going up to seven, it only goes to six. So the process that we're looking at here then is a plus n minus one delta x will be the height of that final rectangle. And we'll see this pretty clearly when we plug in our actual values. If we're looking for L sub n, then in the general sense we'd use delta x summation j equals not 1 to n, but 1 to n minus 1, because I'm looking at the left endpoint of this last rectangle. And this will look like f of a plus, well, actually we can change something here to get rid of that n minus 1. And start, instead of starting with j equal 1 to n minus 1, we can start with j equal 0 here in this particular case. So if we started with 0, and let me write this out and then we'll explain it, why this works. Now there's a couple different ways that we could write this, but this is the way your textbook does. So we'll try and stick with this notation. Now if we plug j equals 0 in here, what ends up happening is 0 times delta x goes to 0, 0 plus a is a, and that produces my first value here. So in this particular case we are starting with a different indice. Another thing to keep in mind is we don't stop at n, we stop at n minus 1 as we do over here. So let's go ahead and look at the same example that we did before, 
but instead of looking at a right endpoint approximation, let's go ahead and calculate a left endpoint approximation. Let's use four rectangles like we did last time for comparison purposes. Same function, x squared, on the interval from 1 to 3. So a quick little curve sketch. We already know that we're going to zoom in on this first quadrant here from 1 to 3. I want to split this up into four rectangles of equal width. So it goes from 1 to 3. So here would be 2, 3 halves, and 5 halves. But now because I'm looking at L4, I'm going to be starting at 1 to plug in for my height to find the height of that rectangle. The height of this rectangle then would be 1 squared, which is 1. Then I'll plug in 3 halves to find the height of the second rectangle. I'll plug in 2 to find the height of the third rectangle, and plug in 5 halves to find the height of the fourth rectangle. And of course, 3 halves quantity squared would be here, 2 quantity squared would be here, and 5 halves quantity squared would be that height. So let's go ahead and plug into our formula L4. So L4, the first thing we need to do is calculate delta x. So let's back up just a bit. Delta x is equal to b minus a over n. b minus a is from our interval, from a to b. So I'll have 3 minus 1 over n. n in this case is 4 rectangles. The 4 comes in from the fact I'm looking for L4. So I get 2 fourths here, which is the same as 1 half. So L4 would equal 1 half. And again, looking from this picture, or you can actually use this formula right here. Actually, let's write that formula out generically. In this case, j equals 0 to n minus 1. 4 minus 1 would be 3. f of a is my value for my interval. 1 plus j delta x is 1 half. So this f of part has not really changed from my right endpoint approximation. What has changed are these indice values. So let's go ahead and rewrite this again. L4 equals 1 half summation. j equals 0 to 3. f of 1 plus j times 1 half, 1 half j, j over 2, however you want to write it. So let's go ahead and plug in here. 1 half out front. This is going to be f of 1 plus j equals 0, so 0. So this is j equals 0, j equals 1, j equals 2, and j equals 3 is what I'm plugging in. j equals 1 will be f of 1 plus j in this case is 1. 1 times 1 half is 1 half. j is 2 in this case. 2 times 1 half is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. And f of 3 would be 1 plus 3 halves. And these would be the values that I would plug into my original function. So that would be f of 1, f of 3 halves, f of 2, and f of 1 plus 3 halves, or 2 halves plus 3 halves is 5 halves. So I'd plug these values into my original function to come up with my approximation. So L4 would be 1 half. Remember, my original function was f of x equals x squared. This would be 1 squared plus 3 halves quantity squared plus 2 squared plus 5 halves quantity squared. So L4, 1 half clear out front, 1 plus 9 fourths plus 4 plus 25 fourths. Continuing to simplify, the 4 plus 1 is 5. That's easy enough to work with. And then 25 fourths plus 9 fourths would leave us with 34 fourths. Finding a common denominator, I have 20 plus 34 over 4. It looks like I'm left with 54 over 4, which of course I should have probably reduced sooner. 54 over 4 is 17 halves which leaves me with 17 fourths. Whoops, let's back up there a second. Half of 54 is 27. So I end up with 27 fourths. So this is my approximation for the area underneath the curve from 1 to 3. Now let's look to see how we wrote that up here. 
We said this is our approximate area underneath the curve f of x equals x squared from 1 to 3. So this is our approximate area under the curve f of x equal x squared on the interval from 1 to 3. Now was this an over or an underestimate? Well, we can look up here at our picture and we can see that each of these rectangles, if I shade them in and I find that area, each of these had this big gap right here that was not included in the area. So I can tell pretty clearly that this is an underestimate. So let's kind of try to summarize what we have here. We had our left endpoint, L4, and we had our right endpoint, R4. So our left endpoint was 27 fourths units squared. My right endpoint, if I look back, I believe was 43 fourths units squared. Uh, these numbers aren't really all that very close. Uh, the distance from 27 to 43 would be what? 16 units. So I have 16 fourths is kind of my error here. Somewhere in between 27 fourths and 43 fourths is my true area. But this is my best estimate. Right now I know my true area is somewhere between 27 fourths and 43 fourths. Now let's look at this kind of the scenario that we just drew here. The left endpoint was an underestimate. The right endpoint was an overestimate. The true area was somewhere in between. So maybe I could approximate the true area using not the left or the right, but using a midpoint formula. So instead of using a right or left endpoint, I could use a midpoint formula. So let's go ahead and look at that midpoint rule. When we look at the midpoint rule, we're going to be producing rectangles again, but instead of using the left or the right endpoint to find the height of the rectangle, we're going to use the midpoint of the width. Now remember, each one of these widths has the same width of a delta x, so that's not changed. So again, each rectangle has a base or a width of delta x. Delta x is b minus a over n. So I find the midpoint between each of these endpoints for my rectangle. I go vertically straight up and that, as soon as it hits the curve, will be the height of this rectangle. So you find the midpoint vertically straight up. That will give us the height of the rectangle. Now notice as we do this, each of these rectangles I think is probably a better estimate because some overestimate a little bit and some underestimate a little bit at the same time. And in so doing, they cancel each other out. Instead of having huge overestimates and huge underestimates on every rectangle, they're each trying to do a better job at the estimation. Well, let's go ahead and look at how we develop a midpoint rule here then. So let's go over and see what this notation would look like. First of all, we know that this delta x would be the base of each rectangle, so that has not changed. What has changed, however, is how we calculate the height. So the height would be plugging in this value right here. Well, this value is a plus half of delta x, because remember, this is an exact midpoint between a and a plus delta x. So this point right here is a plus half of delta x. So that's what comes in right here. For our next rectangle, the base is still delta x, so that's out front. And then I have a plus one full delta x plus another half, so that's three halves delta x. And this, and this progresses until we get up until the very last rectangle. Now the very last rectangle here would be a plus, and if we plug in seven rectangles, I get seven minus a half, or six and a half delta x's. That's what this notation means. And then simplifying, this is my shortcut formula that I would use. Note that this shortcut formula with the summation notation starts at 1. It's a little bit different than the last one we just looked at. So let's go ahead and do the same problem that we've already been doing, same function, but instead of finding L4 or R4, let's find M4. So again, let's go ahead and calculate M4 for the function f of x equals x squared on the interval from 1 to 3. So the first thing, delta x is b minus a over n. That does not change. So 3 minus 1 over 4, which is 1 half. So m4 
would be having a one half out front. And then I go ahead and plug into this formula right up here. So first of all, I'll plug in j equal 1, then j equal 2, j equal 3, and this one will go up to j equal 4 because n is 4 in this case. So here I'll have f of a plus a in this particular case, I guess I could rewrite as a 1, f of 1 plus j minus 1 half. Well, j is 1, so 1 minus 1 half is 1 half times delta x, which is 1 half, plus f of 1 plus, in this particular case I'm plugging in a 2, 2 minus 1 half is 3 halves times delta x is 1 half. Okay, and you can see the progression here, 1 half, 3 halves, next I'll have 5 halves, so you can see the pattern occurring here. And then when I plug in my last one, I'll have 7 halves times 1 half. And of course we have simplification galore here that has to take place. 1 half here. So f of 1 plus 1 fourth is 5 fourths. 1 plus 3 fourths is 7 fourths. 1 plus 5 fourths is 9 fourths. And you can already see the pattern. 4 is the denominator. The numerator is a progression of odd integers, 5, 7, 9. I bet you can guess this one would then be 11 fourths. And I plug this into my original function, which was f of x equals x squared. So let's go ahead and rewrite this. 5 fourths, quantity squared, 7 fourths quantity squared, I also see that we're going to be able to pull out a 1 over 4 squared here. Each of these is going to have a 4 squared in the denominator, so my numerator becomes 5 squared, 7 squared, 9 squared, 11 squared. So 4 squared is 16 times 2 is uh, 32. And then I have 25, 49, 81, 121 for my numerator. Uh, if I add those values up, I get 276 over 32. And of course this will reduce, and I get 69 over 8 here, because both of these are reducible by 4. So this is my approximation. of the area under the curve f of x equals x squared on the interval from 1 to 4, or sorry, one yes, 1 to 4, 1 to 3. Now is this an over or an underestimate? This one's not clear. Before when I was looking at this I could see pretty clearly from my rectangles that it would be an over or an under. But for a midpoint formula it's not as clear. So let's go ahead and draw this to see if we can get any better insight into that. So we'll say this is from 1 to 3. So here we have our 2. Here's 3 halves. Here's 5 halves. Okay so our midpoint here, what's halfway between let's say 2 halves and 3 halves, and if we wanted to rewrite this as 4 fourths and 6 fourths, we can see pretty clearly that midpoint here would be 5 fourths, so this would be 5 fourths. Height here, there's an overestimate here and an underestimate here, so I'm not sure if all this answer will be an over and underestimate right now, but I do know that it's in between our under and our over. So let's go ahead and summarize all three methods. We've looked at the left endpoint, L4. We've looked at the midpoint, M4, and the right endpoint, R4. Now in this particular case, L4, if you recall, was our underestimate, but the left endpoint won't always be an underestimate. It just is this time because I have an increasing function. So L4, if I remember correctly, we had 27 fourths. Midpoint formula here 
was 69 eighths, but I want to have a common denominator of a 4 here. So I had 69 over 8. And finding a common denominator here and reducing by half would leave me with 34.54. And again, the reason I want that is so I can compare these easier. R4 is 43 fourths. So remember, this was my over estimate. This is my underestimate. Now, if my function was decreasing instead of increasing, my left endpoint method would be an overestimate, and my right endpoint would be an underestimate. So R is not always an overestimate. It depends on whether your function is increasing, decreasing, or both. Now, my midpoint, I don't know. It's somewhere in between over and under. So my actual area is somewhere between these. So decimal approximation-wise, this is 6.75. This is 8.625. And this one is 10.75. So my true area is somewhere between 6.75 and 10.75. I think it's closest to this midpoint here. Now our actual area, as soon as we learn some more methods, meaning if we were to compute this exactly, is 8.6 repeating. So this is very close. And you can tell that this is an underestimate and this was an overestimate. And they were off actually by quite a bit. So the midpoint formula with only four rectangles did a super job. It was correct up till the tenth decimal place. Now if four rectangles did a super job, I think that a hundred rectangles would do even better. And if a hundred rectangles does an even better job, what would really be a good idea then is if we had an infinite number of rectangles. And as it turns out, if I use an infinite number of rectangles instead of just four rectangles, I can take the limit as n, the number of rectangles approaches infinity of either the right endpoint method, the left endpoint method, or the midpoint method, it doesn't matter which one, I'm going to get the actual area underneath that curve. So it doesn't matter which method I use, if I use n rectangles, I'll still get a very, very close approximation, if not an exact value, for the area underneath the curve. But before we can do this process, there's some limit notation information and summation notation information that we need to do, uh, that we need to learn. You've probably been exposed to summation notation before, but let's go ahead and run through a few quick examples here. With summation notation, what this indice means is anything that's in my formula that's a J, I'm going to start it out with 1. Then I'll add the same formula evaluated with J equal 2 and do that same process over and over again until I get to J equal 4. So if I had J squared plus 1, this is kind of ambiguous. Does the summation go with the J squared or with the J squared plus 1? Well, put parentheses around it and then it will be clear. If we rewrote this, this would look like 1 squared plus 1 if I plugged in J equal 1. 2 squared plus 1 for j equal 2, 3 squared plus 1 for j equal 4, sorry, 3, and 4 squared plus 1 if j equal 4. So this is a rewrite of that same value. And of course I can see here I have 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 4, 4 squared is 16 is 29, 33, 34 for my sum. So that's one way I can look at rewriting this. Now, an interesting characteristic of summation notation is I can distribute it. So in this case, I have my j squared plus 1. This is the sum of the j squareds, j equal 1 to 4, plus the sum of the j's, j equal 1 to 4 of 1. So I've taken the summation, I've distributed it. Now, from this formula up here, this kind of gives us an indication. j equal 1 to 4, this means if I'm going to sum 1 4 times, and that comes from 1, 2, 3, 4 up here. So this piece right here is equal to 4. This piece right here is 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared. And again, this last piece was 1 times 4. So if this had been a 6, this would say sum 6 4 times. So this would have been 6 times 4. And you can see I still get the same answer here with a little bit less work because I don't have to include all these 1's every time I can recognize some of those shortcuts there. There are some other shortcuts, and they're called power sums. So the power sums say, you know what, we have a faster way of adding up a bunch of numbers. So this says, I want to take j, plug in j equal 1 to n. So this is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 all the way up to n. 
So if this was 1 to a million, that would say sum up the first million integers. And that could take a while. We have a shortcut formula, which is really neat. The shortcut formula just says take the value of n, multiply it by n minus 1, and divide it by 2, and you'll get the same value. So for instance, if j equal 1 to 100, that means to add up the first 100 integers. This would mean 100 times 99 over 2. 2 goes into 150 times, so this would just be 50 times 99 for the sum of the first 100 integers. So these are some nice shortcut formulas for simplifying these types of expressions. So the sum of the j squareds, this would be 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared all the way up to, let's say, 100 squared, whatever n is. Well, instead of adding all those up, we can just look at a shortcut formula, which is n times the quantity n plus 1 times the quantity uh, 2n plus 1 all over 6. And we're going to use these rewrites and these summation notations when we look at n equals or n approaches infinite number of rectangles. Uh, j cubed n squared n plus 1 quantity squared over 4. So again, if I wanted to know the first 100 digits cubed and added, 1 cubed plus 2 cubed plus 3 cubed plus 100 cubed, I'd put 100 squared plus 101 squared all over 4. And I need to double check something real quick here. This is a plus right here. n, n plus 1 over 2. So this would be 100, 101 over 2. 2 goes into 150 times, so this would be 50 times 101 would be our correct summation here. I think there was a minus, and I think I described it as a minus, but it is a plus. So make sure you make that notation change. So again, this is a plus. So let's go ahead and look at computing the area as the limit of approximations. Well, we're still going to be working with the same exact formula. Um, actually, not the formula, the function. So we want to calculate the area under the curve of f of x equals x squared on the interval from 1 to 3. Now, the reason we're doing the same one over and over again is so I can compare my estimates. So again, this is under the curve from 1, uh, from 1 to 3. So it doesn't matter. I can use the formula for the left endpoint. I can use the formula for the right endpoint. Or I can use the formula for the midpoint approximation. So I'm just going to choose one, and I'm going to use the right endpoint. Now, the reason I'm going to use the right endpoint is I think the formula is a little simpler, because I don't have that j minus 1 half or anything like that. So to find the true area, the true area is the limit as n approaches infinity of r sub n. Well, that's equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of b minus a over n, because remember, that's delta x, sum j equal 1 to n, but I'm not going to change n to 4 this time. This time n is going to approach infinity. f of a plus, in this particular case, j times delta x. And again, that delta x is b minus a over n. So this is the general formula. So again, area will equal the limit as n approaches infinity of delta x, which is b minus a over n. So that's 3 minus 1 over n. I'm not going to put in here that n equal 4 this time, because again, n is approaching infinity. j equal 1 to n. f of a, a in this case is the left endpoint of 1, plus j is my indice. Delta x, 3 minus 1 is 2 over n. So this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity. 3 minus 1 is 2 over n. Summation, j equal 1 to n. f of 1 plus, I guess we could write this as 2n over j or 2j over n. So here's my formula that I come up with. And again, we don't want to change any of these n's to 4's this time, because we're using an infinite number of rectangles. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this 1 plus 2j over n, plug it into my original function and try and simplify this. So again, area is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 over n. 
Now, remember, f of x was equal to x squared. So that means we are going to plug 1 plus 2j over n into my original function, and my original function says to square that. My indice is going from 1 to n. So another quick thing I want to point out up here, please note on all these shortcuts, all the indices start at 1. If your industry doesn't start at 1, then these shortcut formulas don't work. So it's important that you note that your indice starts at 1. So from here, I'm left with the limit as n approaches infinity, 2 over n. Let's see if we can rewrite this summation a little bit. I'd like to find a common denominator. So I'm going to leave the summation here, j equal 1 to n. And my common denominator here would be n. So I have n plus 2j all over n quantity squared. So again, we just found a common denominator right here inside this base. Then what I can do is I can distribute the squared to the numerator and denominator. Now I'm not going to distribute it through the sum in the numerator, just to the numerator and denominator. So this is going to look like n plus 2j quantity squared all over n squared. Now if we look at this, the indice says j goes from 1 to n, so the only thing that's changing here is the j. The n is not, so I can pull this n squared out front. And again, the more we can pull out, the simpler this will be to work with. So I have uh, 2 over n cubed, j equal 1 to n, now remember, I can't take this squared and distribute it through here, so I'm actually going to FOIL this out. This will look like n squared plus 4nj plus 4j squared. And again, that's first, outside, insides, last. Now what we're going to do is distribute the sum through each piece, keeping in mind that I have this 2 over n cubed out front of all of this. So I'm going to take the sum and distribute it through to each piece. Now what we can do is we can further simplify this by pulling out coefficients and constants. So rewriting again, I have the limit as n approaches infinity, 2 over n cubed, I need to keep with my cap n's here, I keep switching, leave them as cap n's. On this first one, right here, I can pull the n squared out front, because it's not changing. And then what ends up happening is I'm left with the sum j equal 1 to n of 1. Now over in this next one, I can pull out the 4n. So out front, I'm left with the 4n out front times the sum of the j's, j equal 1 to cap n. And then the same thing with this next one, I can pull the 4 out front, and then I'm left with the sum of the j squareds, j equal 1 to n. Well these are all right here for my shortcut formulas, so now I can use these power sums for my shortcut formulas. And the power sums will be given to you on a test or a quiz if you need them, I'll put them up on the board or on a formula sheet. So let's go ahead and rewrite again, the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 over n cubed, so we have n squared. Now what is the sum of the 1's n times? So if I sum 1 n times, I get n. Now up above from my formula, when I look at the sum of the j's, the sum of the j's are n times n plus 1, and remember that's a plus, all over 2. So the sum of the j's is n times n plus 1 over 2. The sum of the j squareds, from our formulas and our power sums up above are n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. So this is looking pretty ugly, but I think we can come up with a good solution here. Limit as n approaches infinity. Remember, we still have this 2 over n cubed out front. So here I have n cubed 
plus. This 2 cancels into the 4 twice, and it looks like I'm left with 2 n squared times n would be 2 n cubed, so 2 n times n times n is 2 n cubed. 2 times n times n times 1 is plus 2 n squared. And then simplifying this last piece, <clears throat> 2 goes into 4 twice and it goes into 6 3 times. So for this last piece here, I'll have a 2 n out front, and then I have n plus 1 times 2 n plus 1 would be 2 n squared plus 2n plus n is plus 3n plus 1, and this is all over 3. My next step I'll distribute. Uh, it looks like I combined some like terms here, n cubed plus 2n cubed. They don't have a denominator, so they're like terms here. So that would be 3n cubed plus 2n squared plus, it looks like I have 2 Actually, that'd be a 4. 2n times 2n squared would be 4n cubed plus 6n squared plus 2n over 3, but it's only these last three terms that are over 3. Next, I'll find my common denominator. Common denominator here is 3, so this would look like 9n cubed when I multiply top and bottom here by 3 plus 6n squared, when I multiply top and bottom here by 3, plus 4n cubed, plus 6n squared, plus 2n, all over 3. Okay. So I can pull the 3 out front, so now I have 2 over 3n cubed. Now let's see what's left in here. 9 plus 4 is 13n cubed. <clears throat> now remember what we're shooting for is a degree in the numerator and the degree in the denominator. That's all we really care about, but I'm going to simplify this completely. Uh, our n squareds look like a 12n squared and then plus 2n. So limit as n approaches infinity, 26n cubed plus 24n squared plus 4n all over 3n cubed. Now here, the degree in the numerator and the degree in the denominator are the same, so the limit is the ratio of the leading coefficients. And of course we have to have something to justify that. So 26 thirds is my exact area under the function f of x equals x squared on the interval from 1 to 3. Well let's see, 26 thirds is a decimal. Um, let's see, 8 times 3 is 24, and then 2 thirds would be 8.6 repeating. This is our exact answer, and if you recall, we compared this to some values in this table up here when we compared our three methods. And so here we had, so we can compare it up here to our particular group. Now this 8.6 is what we just got was our 26 thirds and we got this by taking the limit as n approaches infinity of r sub n. I could have used l sub n and m sub n, m sub n as well, but I just used what I thought would to be the more simple formula. So we can see here that we get an exact value. The m sub 4 did a pretty good job but this gives us an exact value, and of course we'd always choose an exact value over an approximation as long as we didn't have to give up anything to get it. So these are pretty long problems, tons of algebra, very little calculus actually, but lots and lots of algebra to come up with these approximations. It's very important to use your brackets and parentheses correctly, that you don't drop signs, and that you show every step. Hopefully you'll enjoy working on these. Thank you!